Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the regular session of the Scarborough Town Council Wednesday, February 3, 2016 meeting. Uh, call to order, and if you would please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, roll call. Councilor Baybine. Present. Councilor Rowan. Here. Councilor Katarina. Here. Councilor Hayes. Here. Councilor Chiazzo. Here. Chairman Donovan. Here. Uh, as many of you may know, uh, a former town council member, Jim Benedict, uh, passed away on this Sunday. And I would like to ask everyone to take a moment of silence to honor uh, his memory, a very fine man. Thank you. Uh, we'll go to uh, general public comments and anyone wishing to uh, address the council on anything other than what's on the agenda this evening you can uh, approach the podium. Uh, my name is Susan Fox. I'm the Council, and, um, I live at, um, and I came to the, to the workshop uh, of because there were a couple of issues regarding Pine Point. And, um, and I am very concerned about the Charlie Gendron proposal <coughs> um, to discontinue Avenue 2. I think that um, we've got a public access point, um, and, a, uh, and we don't have too many public access points to, to the beach. And I think it comes down to um, if the town does in fact still own this road and have rights to this road, should we decide that we don't want the road, it's 50 feet wide, let's sell it at fair market value. If we don't have a right to the road anymore, that our, our rights have been extinguished because the town took no action, well, basically, there is nothing we can do, and they already own it. So if they do already own it, does the town then go back and get taxes from them for the years that they actually enjoyed the property? And um, so I would ask you to please go very slowly with this. I think it's the last thing that, that the residents of Pine Point would want to see right now. Thank you. Uh, anyone else who would like to speak, please approach the podium. Uh, my name is Chris Lyford from One Hunter Point Drive in Scarborough. Uh, first, I just want to thank everyone for the opportunity to speak um, and also for your service. My wife, Carrie, is a recent new member of this Board of Education, and I'm more aware than ever of the commitment that you all have made to the town and to the service that you put in, so thank you for that. I'm also here as a member of the supporter of Scarborough Schools tonight, and further as a parent of three kids in the school system, one at Wentworth and one at the Blue Point two at the Blue Point schools. I was unable to attend the last meeting due to a school concert, but I did watch the meeting online afterward and wanted to make a few comments about the budget goals that were discussed and established at that meeting. I do this also in light of the Maine Department of Education's preliminary fiscal year 2016 and 17 essential programs and services funding model that shows Scarborough potentially receiving a million and a half dollars less this next budget year than this year. First, regarding the Town Council's recent budget goals, I was pleased to see an obvious level of compromise and camaraderie on the, school, on the Town Council at that meeting. It's obvious that you've spent a lot of time on it. <clears throat> After last year's budget cycle, we recognized the need for all of us to come together and to work together toward a, a better budget process. At the same time, I also urge you to have spirited debate. I think we need that in this town, and I don't think it necessarily has to be per se divisive. Second, in that spirit, while I don't agree with having one of the goals of the council be a line in the sand of a fixed percentage increase in this year's budget, 
I agree with everyone's comments that compromise will be needed and tough choices will have to be made. With these, with these competing points in mind, I still want to express my concern that we risk being stuck in the wrong paradigm of focusing on percentage increases in budgets rather than communicating the positives of restoring lost programming in schools or expanding staffing or adding learning opportunities to our schools for our kids. In particular, adding learning opportunities that help our kids thrive in the new economy that we face in the future. This is particularly important in relation to the potential for a reduction in school funding it puts pressure on your line in the sand immediately and risks, again, creating the impression that we're growing budgets in an out-of-control manner. We must address the state funding problem. It's my hope that elected officials in Augusta will fight more for the town and for the schools in the future. But in the near term, we must focus on what we can affect in the town. We must not let, let state funding issues rob our schools of new investments that lead to better outcomes for kids. This coming budget cycle, I'm asking you to support new investments in programming clubs, sports, teachers that help our students and our children succeed and thrive, even if these might push your line in the sand a little bit higher. I'll give you a very quick example, um, allowing for time if I have it. Several years ago, the intermediate schools and even primary schools lost foreign languages. It's my belief that it's more important than ever to introduce that at the younger ages. Study after study proves that that's incontrovertible. It, by my numbers, this won't add greatly to the, to the town's mill rate, but it's a worthwhile effort to consider, and I urge you to consider such improvements, and for all of us to communicate that these are improvements to the town members, not just percentages. Therefore, it's my great hope that you'll set your sights above a line in the sand, hear our plea for investing well above level services, and support progress in the next school and town budget. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anyone else who would like to address the town council? <coughs> Excuse me. Hi, my name is Mo Erickson. I live in Pine Point on the Pine Point Road. I grew up down in Pine Point and um, have lived there all my life along with my family. I currently have four kids uh, and a husband. And um, I know I missed a workshop earlier tonight about the, um, oh, I guess the gentrification, I would call it, of Pine Point, soon to be. I can tell you that as a lifelong Pine Pointer, please, leave it alone. All we need is a new sidewalk. One, one new sidewalk, where the existing sidewalk is, just come in, give us a new sidewalk. Take care of the parking that's a hazard from the, uh, essentially the depot road from Snow's Canning Factory to the Clam Bake. Take care of that. Put in a sidewalk from Bailey's Campground all the way down to the Old Orchard Beach Line. That's all we need. We don't need anything fancy. We don't need a third lane. We don't need lights. We don't need flashes. We all just need a new sidewalk. I beg you, please leave my town, my, my little piece of heaven alone. I don't want anyone to come in and relegate and delegate how big my house is going to be or what kind of windows I need and on and on and on. There are so many people I know that feel the same way and I'm just going to also ask you, please notify the people in Pine Point of what's in store and what people, somebody has this grandiose idea, hey, we're going to come in and beautify Pine Point, and we want your opinion. I want you guys to, to phone us, call us, mail us, put it in the paper, because I know that a lot of the old Pine Pointers down there feel exactly like I do. I mean, I, I think of a, of a little part of Old Orchard, Ocean Park, and I see people flock to Ocean Park because it's been untouched. It's lovely. People walk. Nobody bothers them. It's not all beautified and, and made more modern. And that's what people like. And I'm, I have to say, I think most people in Pine Point like it the way it is. So thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to address the town council? Uh, 
Hi, I'm Hillary Jargon. I live at 9 Sequoia Lane. This is my daughter, Lila. Uh, I don't have a big speech plan, but I just wanted to reiterate what Chris had said earlier, um, that we have found out that we might have even further reduced funding from the state for our schools, and that it's incredibly important to me and my family that um, we don't just maintain level services, but we start to try and add back some of what we've lost over the past years. Um, and to do that, we might need to increase our budget past a certain percentage point. Um, and it's not that we're overspending, but that we are losing money from the state. So I just wanted to put that in your ear and um, for budget season, which I know is coming up. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anyone else? Close the uh, general public comment period. Uh, minutes of January 20, 2016, regular meeting. Uh, your pleasure. Move approval. Second. Uh, any uh, corrections or comments? Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? It's unanimous. Uh, adjustments to the agenda? There are none. None to be made. Items to be signed. There are treasurer warrants, which I will do later. Uh, no uh, uh, oh, business. Resolution 16-001, requesting the town council's support on the Transportation <coughs> Improvement Program project to PACS. Uh, pleasure of the council. Uh, public comment first. Thank you. Seeing none, we'll close the public comment period. Pleasure of the council. So moved. Second. Uh, discussion. Who would like to start? Start at this end, Chris. Yeah, I just, uh, for those of you who didn't go to the workshop, I just want to reiterate, and for, for my benefit and theirs as well, um, this is not necessarily an action for a budget item. It's just to, um, uh, I guess, acknowledge that this is the direction we'd want to move eventually as a, as a town and as a council. So. Um, we're not talking about, um, as far as I'm aware, committing funds at this point. It's just more of a conceptual type of approach. So. Thank you. I think uh, a good point, uh, Councilor Kaiser. I'm going to ask the town manager, for those who did not, who are tuning in at 7 o'clock and did not see the workshop, for a little summary of what this resolution is intended to uh, accomplish. Yes, there are three projects that uh, we'd like to request funding for, uh, one of which is the Gorham Road reconstruction. Uh, this would be for funding cycle uh, uh, 2017. That would be construction the spring of 2017 uh, at the very earliest. The other projects are in the Pine Point area uh, involving the intersection of Pine Point Road and um, East Grand Avenue and then East Grand Avenue itself. Uh, that's much further out in the 2019 to 2021 time frame for construction. Um, Gorham Road project is farther along in conversation and design. We've had at least two public engagement meetings and intend to have more. We've not even begun that process with Pine Point Road. So to the speakers that addressed you moments ago, uh, yeah. clearly that's a process that we need to undertake. Um, and some of that conversation will happen as soon as the spring. But the action in front of you is really to uh, lend your endorsement to staff's application for getting in the funding queue and, or funding cycle. Uh, it makes no firm commitments other than blessing the application. Should we be successful, uh, there certainly will be fu uh, future action and consideration for you at that time. And, and this is a requirement of submitting the applications. If you want to be able to, they're scored applications, and if you want it to be uh, uh, given the same consideration as other applications from other communities, uh, it's necessary to have the town council of each body, each uh, municipality, endorse the application. It's, uh, it's worth noting, there's, uh, I'm, I'm going to estimate, but I suspect there's probably ten times as much money requested as there is available. Uh, so these are very competitive, you know, having the elected body at least at the front end, give some nod that this is a direction that's worth pursuing, uh, you know, is an important part of that. But it's uh, highly, highly competitive, so the more complete, and this is a requirement, uh, our application is, uh, the better our chances are. Recognize uh, Councillor Hayes, who is also on the Transportation Committee, which has reviewed this. 
Yeah, and, 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 and for the purpose of the audience, I, I just wanted to share that it's been a, it, it's a very dedicated committee that has spent a lot of time reviewing this and asking questions and really well vetted. I've been really impressed with the amount of work done by the staff, the amount of public input that's taken place already, especially on the Gorham Road project. And as a liaison, I, I guess I would recommend that we move forward with, with going after the funding and getting in the queue, so to speak. Um, I, I, I'm just kudos to you guys, great great work, and, and the, the public should rest assured that there's been public meetings and a lot of folks that have weighed in, and the meetings, the Transportation Committee meetings are open, so come join us as we continue the conversation. Thank you. Comments from others? Satisfied? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I will say that uh, uh, the planning staff and the uh, 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 and Mike Shaw's operation has looked at this very carefully. And we are holding uh, uh, meetings on the first, most recent phase, the close nearest in phase. Already I attended a public session that was very well attended. Uh, many, many uh, people in those neighborhoods along Gorham Road who would be impacted participated. So uh, uh, people uh, <coughs> should expect more of that. Uh, and this is one step in the road towards getting as much funding as we can from uh, additional sources. So, uh, all in favor? Opposed? Unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, new business. <clears throat> uh, order number 16-011, first reading and schedule a planning board public hearing on the proposed amendment to Chapter 405, the Zoning Ordinance of the Town of Scarborough, Maine, Section Roman Numeral 3, nonconformance <coughs> subsection C, to allow nonconforming structures to be elevated to meet floodplain requirements. Uh, I would ask the town planning director to address this uh, for everyone's benefit. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, this is a, a zoning amendment really to, to eliminate two conflicting uh, ordinances that exist right now. It's actually been a long-standing issue. Um, it came up recently with the Higgins Beach uh, zoning updates that we've worked on and the council's very involved in over the past six or eight months where our zoning ordinance um, says that non-conforming structures can't be enlarged, expanded, and increased in height. That's the key um, piece of discussion for this amendment and we have a lot of non-conforming structures in our beach communities along the beach frontage. Again, we address some of that through Higgins Beach, um, but we have a lot of non-conforming structures that also happen to be in the shoreland areas and in our flood zones. And in our flood zones, the, the, uh, the flood ordinance that's required by uh, the state and federal government requires you and encourages you to elevate structures um, for resiliency and for loss of property and life during storms. So right now often um, property owners want to modernize their, their beachfront home or cottage. Um, they want to make it more resilient. They want to elevate it to meet flood zone requirements and because they're non-conforming, another ordinance, the zoning ordinance says you have to go to the zoning board to get a variance to do that. So in one ordinance we're saying you're required to elevate if you're making improvements or if you, you want to be more resilient. In another, we're not allowing it or saying the only way you can do it is to get a variance. So that puts property owners in a sort of a catch-22 and sends them to the zoning board to do something that um, we expect them to do somewhere else in our ordinances. So this is a fairly simple amendment to say that um, Increasing the height of a structure that might be non-conforming um, isn't re is allowed for. Doesn't require you to get a variance. If you're doing other things um, with a non-conforming structure, like adding on or um, expanding in other ways, you still would need to get a variance because that's not something that's required for in our flood zones. Um, but if you're simply elevating a structure to be uh, better protected about uh, better protected from flooding impacts, then that doesn't need to get a variance. That can be something that they go in and get a building permit and then meet the flood zone requirements and can do by right. So it's, it's kind of a cleanup matter um, that we've had uh, a need to address for a while and we 
wanted to do it separate from the Higgins Beach Initiative because this is a broader scope. It applies to all of our flood zones and our coastal areas, so <coughs> that's why we're bringing it to you now after the Higgins Beach effort's been, um, yep. been accomplished. So I'm happy to answer questions if you have any on this. We'll start down here. Uh, Dean Marie, you want to go first and then Will? Yeah. <laughs> Um, Dan, just I support this. I think this makes all the sense in the world, but I can hear some people who live in these areas saying, <coughs> so someone wants to raise their house by, I forget what the height is for the resilience, but and now I'm not going to be able to see the ocean from my second story window, and what recourse do I have? Whereas before they could at least go before ZBA and they could. Complain um, about it. Yeah, I mean, the <laughs> allowance is to elevate only for the flood zone requirements. Right. So it's it's actually dictated by the other ordinance that you Okay, that's, that you I just need wanted to you it. to admit. Yeah. Uh, I'm just <coughs> bringing forth something I know you can right, no, hear it, about. <laughs> if people are elevating more than is required by the flood zone um, requirements or <coughs> elevating in, in different locations not because of the flood zone requirements, then they wouldn't be entitled to do it without a variance. Right. Um, so that's a, kind of a subtlety that needs to be identified. Okay. Yeah. Council Rowan? So, how, I mean, I guess I don't have a good understanding of how high are we talking right. is typical yeah. for, for one of these requirements? It, it totally varies based mm -hmm. on um, the location of the property as it relates to the highest annual tide. Um, so it, in Higgins Beach, typically a structure, and this is typically, but so it, it varies, a uh, structure is um, kind of five feet higher than street level. You know, that's common. If you're close right along the ocean, you might be the first floor, I mean the first floor. So the, the first floor is five feet higher than the street level. Um, if you're closer to to the beach in some places, it might be seven. Um, but if you're back further from the beach and you're further up gradient, you might only be elevating three feet instead of a foot and a half, which might be typical for a foundation. So it's very dependent on the building site's relationship to uh, the, the high tide line, basically. So if I'm understanding correctly, then we're typically the house is currently at street level. They're elevating that five to seven feet their ocean front or are they already three feet up and they need to go up another two it it varies. totally varies um, it's for <coughs> generally they're older cottages that haven't been added on to or updated and um, property owners want to lower their insurance rates they mm -hmm. want to be more protected from storm damage mm -hmm. and in, in some cases they want to <coughs> renovate for other reasons um, and so those are the properties we're dealing with where there are cottages that weren't designing to be at all kind of resilient to, to storms. Um, often they're, they don't even have a foundation. You know, it might be, uh, they might be on a wood foundation, a cinder block foundation that could be, and Bill probably has firsthand knowledge of this, um, they could be a foot above, you know, ground level, they could be two, and they would, might need to go to five, they might need, you know, anywhere from three to eight feet needs to be their new first floor uh, elevation. Other questions? Sounds okay. So, so two questions, Dan. Um, I, I, my understanding is this is already a height limit restriction in that zone. Um, which would override if they go above floodplain? Would they have to go in front of the ZBA to get a a zone amendment to exceed that height? If they're just lifting the whole structure up and it puts them above that height? Or is, does one area, <coughs> would this override the height limitations in the zoning? This would not <coughs> override the height limitations in the zoning. In the town shoreland zoning, which is actually the same area um, that these properties would be in, in most cases, the height limit is 35 feet to the top of the structure, so usually the, the ridge line. Um, so this isn't relieving them of that height limitation. It's, it's relieving them of going to uh, the zoning board for just elevating the first story, where the first story starts. Um, so they'd still have to 
abide by the 35 foot height limit unless they went to the zoning board to get relief from that but this doesn't relieve them of that automatically okay and the second question I have I know you mentioned in the workshop earlier the FEMA flood maps are getting updated do we what kind of impact do we see in terms of potentially increasing the impact of of this or are we just kind of anticipating it's you know it's just going to be restricted kind of the same areas with different criteria if you will yeah, the flood maps are likely to add more properties to um, certainly the, fl the flood zones. The revisions are going to go more inland from the shoreline. I think that's um, very likely. It, the devils are in details as to how far and in what areas exactly. That's where we've been working hard on reviewing the maps and being ready for whether we appeal their, their approach. Um, but yeah, that certainly more properties will be faced with that as the, the maps are updated, faced with this kind of conflict, and this is in part why we want to address this before before then. Yeah, and to pick up on uh, uh, Councilor Kayser's question, uh, the FEMA flood maps uh, are likely to demonstrate uh, uh, more properties being within the 100-year floodplain, which, as I understand it, is really an insurance issue as opposed to shoreland zoning issue? It's an insurance issue. It's also a um, requirement to, as it relates to this, to elevate your structure if you're improving the structure. Over 50% of the value of the structure, if you're improving a your structure, you need to elevate to meet um, the you know, the requirements to be one foot above the base flood elevation. Um, so that's another component to this. Yeah, insurance rates and structural changes if you're investing in your in your property. Other questions? Will? C could you help me understand the, the height limit? Is that measured from the ground or is that measured from the first floor, the overall height of the structure? So if you lift it up, the height limit goes up with you. The height limit doesn't stay, change. The height limit's 35 from feet from the ground and it, it's like average grade. Um, so all this is doing is saying that if, because right now there's a lot of one and a half story cottages um, that have room to kind of grow vertically. Um, and so if you had a one and a half story cottage that <coughs> right now has a foot, a, the first floor is a foot above grade and it, the peak is at 20 feet, then and the, the requirement is to elevate now seven feet above grade to meet flood requirements, then that structure is 27 feet high versus 20, uh, for example. Um, so it's still complying with the height limit, um, but it's elevated the first floor. So that, that's not living space, it's on piles, it's, it's unfinished space that can withstand flooding and, and, and protect the living space um, above. Great, thank you. Chris? Sorry, just a quick follow-up too on the FEMA maps. Um, is that also going to not just broaden the area, but it's going to change the, the height of the floodplain as well? Is that, or is it just the area? It's, I think it would recalculate yeah. base flood elevations, yeah. Okay. So it could, it could affect existing properties so that are in the flood zone. Oh, okay. yeah. would, it, would it make sense perhaps to wait? I mean, when are those maps going to become updated and available? <laughs> I mean, I, well, I don't know if we're in the middle of it or if it's close to the end or... It's a good you know, question, though, to clarify. Yeah. It's, it's a perennially <laughs> moving target. Um, <laughs> they now say the maps might come out this spring, which restarts a process that had been restarted a few times in the past <laughs> five years. Um, and then there's a... It's a very long process in terms of their maps are released. There's a review period. There's a public comment <coughs> period. There then is an appeal period. Um, so even if it starts this spring, it's probably another two years before the new ones are adopted. And that's, I guess, with a lot of uncertainty. Um, there are people today that are interested in making improvements that are in the flood zone now. Um, you know, I think that it would be, if the council is comfortable with it, I encourage you to you know, kind of move forward with it for those that are affected now. There will be additional ones that will result from the new map, certainly. Councillor Bayden? Um, 
I, I think you just answered my question, but let me ask it um, just in case if I didn't hear it right. So um, this is, I think, um, a great move. It's kind of, um, um, to me, obvious that you need to do this. The question I have is that, because um, I know, that, by the way, if you think this is going to be a really serious issue, because this isn't about beachfront properties. This is about a very wet rural community that we live in that's going to affect a lot of houses even that are significantly away from the uh, shoreline. Um, are there other ordinances that we'll be looking at in the near future once we understand where this flood mapping is going? Because I would see, I mean, there's going to be setback issues from, you know, flood zones um, and other environmental issues that come up. Is that going to be a major effort of your department later? Or is that going to be relied on through conservation and some of the town committees? In terms of just kind of overall resiliency in yeah. terms of flooding and well just the impact of the changes to the flood map once it becomes known um, I think there's going to be a significant overhaul of many ordinances and rules and guidelines that we have to follow and is that yeah, all we'll have forefront? to really look at what the maps look like the scope of the okay. changes and how that interplays with other the zoning ordinance and other ordinances um, we have done the past few years we've done some pretty kind of creative things with our right. stream buffers where we've required greater stream buffers actually yep. to uh, in the case of new development keep people away from floodplains so they're not faced with these issues so they, they're not this yep. year building in a floodplain and then a few years from now having to elevate because um, because of these changes so We've been looking at things like that. The Conservation Commission okay. is kind of invo in involved in that. So um, I think we'd continue to do that. Good. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Will. Sorry, you said something a minute ago that um, I was a little bit confused by. I was hoping you'd clarify. You said there are a couple that are that are waiting to do improvements um, that, that would be impacted by this. My understanding was that if there's any kind of improvement, if they're non-conforming, they would still have to go before the, the board. CBA. Yeah. Well, there's some properties in Higgins Beach that now meet the current Higgins Beach code, and they, they wouldn't have to get a variance, but for they'd have to get a variance to elevate to meet flood requirements. Even though they're non-conforming. Right. They're non -con they were, no, they're yeah, they're non-conforming in terms of, um, like, one of their setbacks. And so they can't, and they're not allowed to move their building around. They have to just elevate it vertically um, because there's so many different <laughs> rules right along the the shoreline that basically constrain anything you can do there's the sand dune rules there are shoreland rules so um, yeah they're not conforming based on how close they are to a property line but they're not allowed to move their buildings but they can add on a different place if they're adding on a different place they have to elevate the whole structure to give you the whole story. <laughs> <laughs> I think I understand. Thank you. Chris. Uh, sorry, just to follow up in. So uh, if recalling from Higgins Beach, there are some um, uh, aesthetic criteria that's associated with that. Now, uh, thinking about, you know, in, down in Florida and other places, you have a lot of beach houses on stilts. Mm -hmm. How is, is, do you see any conflict necessarily between that design and that, that aesthetic or that structure with the existing Higgins Beach zoning requirements now? or? Or would they be allowed to, as long as they're within the height footprint requirements and restrictions, they can put a house on stilts and have it up there? Yeah, the Higgins Beach Code actually included kind of design recommendations on how to treat the, you know, the elevated structure, the part of the structure, so the sort of below the first floor um, with like lattice work or, you know, different approaches. So there's actually some good guidance in the zoning code to to address that as best as possible. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Other questions at the moment? We'll have, uh, uh, thank you, Dan. Uh, public comment. Uh, uh, anyone wishing to address this can approach the podium. Seeing none, we'll close the public comment. Uh, pleasure of the board. Move approval. Second. Uh, discussion. Who would like to start? at this end. It, um, thank you. I, I think this is the logical reaction to something that's needed to move it forward. Um, I'm pleased to hear that we'll keep in mind, because uh, this has been something, the whole floodplain issue and the flood zones have been an issue. And um, while this might be a political opinion, it, it, to me, it is a direct relationship to the AIG and the whole um, recessionary issues that we dealt with, and then also the severe weather um, 
uh, things that we've dealt with, whether it's Sandy and, you know, the other pieces. So it's about insuring properties is what it comes down to, I really believe. This isn't about houses not being high enough and low enough. It's about whether or not those houses can get insured and then their property being protected. So I think that this is the right move for this, and I think it's going to be a bigger deal down the road for houses that aren't even close to the shoreline and, you know, they're within that 25 foot, 40 feet of the flood zone and what that's going to do because if I remember correctly and I talked with one citizen, the, re the, the remapping is pretty significant where the houses that were originally within the 25 or away from the 25 feet, now the part of their house is actually in the flood zone. Right. Um, so, and that's like inland. <laughs> so um, this is going to be a bigger issue. Uh, other comments? Chris? Uh, so for first reading, I think it's, you know, it makes sense. I, uh, the fact that um, I think we're still limited in height, the, the overriding um, concern I think maybe some residents would have is what's it going to look like, what's it going to, you know, if I have to look at something like this. There's things within the existing ordinances in terms of treating it um, aesthetically and in height limitation. So um, I don't see any initial problems. It's a first reading, so I'd welcome comments from anybody, um, obviously, to uh, other opinions between now and second <coughs> reading. But um, as it stands now, um, with explanations from, from Mr. Bacon, I, I don't see any reason that we wouldn't move this forward. Uh, I will say that, as uh, the town planner pointed out, there is no compromise in the height uh, issue. This is really uh, a matter of eliminating an inconsistency. Uh, one aspect of the ordinance mandates a change. Uh, the other prohibits it. Uh, and we're really uh, uh, eliminating the condition that mandates elevating when certain conditions of improvement to the property are initiated. Uh, seeing no other comment, all in favor? Opposed? It's unanimous. Uh, this will now go to the planning board for uh, its review. And we'll be back for a second reading with a recommendation of the planning board uh, as soon as the planning board has had the opportunity to review it. Next order of business. Uh, Order 16-012, act on the request to amend Chapter 302A, the Town Committee Board's manual relating to the Scarborough Housing Alliance. Uh, as a way of introduction, I'll ask the Town Manager to uh, give a little clarification as to what is involved in this matter. Yes, and I may also defer to Councilor Rowan, who's on the Housing Alliance, but as a matter of basic structure, um, Tony could probably recall the year, but during my tenure, it must have been in 2010 or 11, actually the Rules and Policies Committee of the Council uh, extracted out uh, a bunch of the different committee structures that had been adopted through the various decades, frankly. Uh, they were all embedded <coughs> in different ways, uh, forms or another, in Chapter 302. And they pulled them out, consulted them, them all in 302A, and it's really a manual. So all of the boards and committees that have formal structure and are standing, um, their initial enabling legislation, any unique scope and requirements associated, uh, and also including uh, composition. Many of them are very clear in uh, what their membership is made up of and certainly how many <coughs> members each has. In this particular case, the Housing Alliance, um, during my nine years in having involved, I don't think we've ever had a full complement of seven members. And though there are fairly rare occasions where they're taking formal votes, uh, they often find themselves lacking a quorum. So with that, and I'll perhaps defer to Council Rowan to talk about what solution has come forward. Sure. So the, um, the observation has been in, in the two meetings since I've been the liaison that we haven't had a quorum. Um, it's a fairly, you know, there are a couple of open position seats on the committee right now, so the, the solution uh, that we came up with was to make the liaison a voting member instead of a non-voting member and, and therefore increase the uh, chance that we'll have a, a quorum at a meeting in case there was an action that needed to be taken. So the amendment to the manual is uh, a single amendment to uh, make the liaison town council member a voting member of the committee. Uh, Public comment. Anyone in the audience wishing to make comment on this? 
close public comment. Uh, what's your pleasure? Move approval. Second. Uh, I will say that um, after checking with the town clerk, this is a manual. It is not an ordinance that requires a first and second reading. Uh, and therefore, uh, it's action that is up for final uh, adoption tonight. Uh, any comments? Chris, and then we'll go to Peter. Sorry. Uh, just a, a question. Uh, why did, did we consider going from seven to five members um, and then having a, a quorum be easier to obtain? And, and if we did, what were the maybe the downsides of doing that versus having the council member a voting member? And if there's any really kind of precedent or any concerns with having a council member as a voting member for that for that particular board? So we, we did talk about the, the idea of making the committee smaller. That was another option that we had. Um, the, the hope is that we're going to uh, housing is is a fairly affordable housing is a fairly diverse um, skill set that we're looking for on on the board and we're hoping to fill it out with a number of different positions of, of people with different talents and so the um, the this was what we came up with uh, their their uh, the model was actually the uh, the historic preservation implementation committee which has the liaison as a as a voting member and it works well there um, so we thought we would adopt that as well and as a practical matter I can say that very consistently, there are three members plus the liaison is, has been a <coughs> religious attendee. So there's uh, very comfortably four members already in this meeting. So I think the, the group can function. Uh, and ideally, we'd like to fill it out with some extra expertise. Peter? And I, well, I think just to kind of build on the question and Tom's comment, how many of the other liaisons are actually voting members of committees? I kind of assume that most of them mm -hmm. are not. Are those the only two exceptions? that we have? We'll do some research, but I, I believe you might be correct. I think the uh, uh, former Councillor Holbrook, having been long served on the Alliance, um, I think took that experience uh, when the Historic Preservation Committee was formed, and I suspect she um, was quite influential in making that happen in that regard. Uh, it seems to be a, a workable solution. Uh, certainly, mm -hmm. you, could, you could change the total number, and that would accomplish the same thing as well. But I guess only my perspective is just the, you know, the liaison, having council members be liaisons to kind of bring things to the table and explain them is right. a little bit different than actually being a voting member of the committee. So I just, I struggle with that a little bit. So yeah, I guess the only thing I would say, there was some conversation, does that potentially put that member of council uh, uh, in a conflict? Right. Um, at least uh, for purposes of, uh, of the Housing Alliance, there are very few, if any, I mean, it's advisory to the council. There's no final action taken. Uh, they're, they're not quasi-judicial in any capacity. Their decisions are not final. They're advisory only. So I think the, the likelihood of a conflict um, is slim to none, at least in that capacity. That's not to say other committees, it might, it might be an issue. Yeah, I'm, I'm more worried about precedent and what does it say. And <clears throat> other comments? Uh, I guess I would say well, an, answer, an answer to that. I, I'm only on a couple committees, so I just thought this was <laughs> but, uh, uh, but we did talk about it at the meeting, and I, I think the the uh, Tom's point was kind of carried the uh, carried the day from that perspective. That it, given the nature of the committee, it's probably not right. going to be an issue. But I, I see your point as well. Actually, in uh, 2004, uh, they uh, increased the membership from five to seven. Why? I'm not. I'm not sure. And it, hmm. Those were the boom years, though, right? <laughs> Other comments? <laughs> uh, seeing none. Uh, all in favor? Opposed? Five in favor, mm -hmm. one against. Thank you. Uh, no uh, non-action items. Uh, standing and special committee reports and liaison reports. Uh, Jean Marie, why don't we start with you and we'll work down. Mine's going to be very short. <laughs> Long Range Planning Committee was moved to February 12th, so we didn't meet. And Conservation Commission meets next Monday at 7 o'clock in Town Hall. And that's it. Will? Uh, so the Housing Alliance met. We had uh, two new members, uh, Eric Boucher and, and Bob Porter, um, which brings our total number to, uh, to five. Um, we are currently looking for um, 
individuals that have building and construction experience as well as uh, potentially some, some banking experience. Um, it's, it's a really hard problem and we're really in need of um, experienced and knowledgeable help. Um, we uh, we got a, an update on the Habitat project from um, a director at Habitat, Mark Primo. Um, we're continuing to try and provide guidance to builders so that those products that are in motion that that have a uh, taken advantage of the bonus density in, in order with the understanding they'll provide affordable housing that we can provide them some guidance in terms of what that should look like. Um, and uh, and then we also move the uh, the action that we just <coughs> took action on. Um, historical preservation also met. Uh, we're continuing to expand our um, uh, cemetery I inventory. Um, we're considering a cemetery cleanup day um, sometime in the spring. Um, there's been some interest in individuals that uh, live nearby cemeteries um, that would be interested in in, uh, in helping, and they've, they've actually approached um, a couple of the members. Um, we're also starting to plan the, a dedication ceremony for the uh, Danish Village Arch, and then uh, we're also looking to update the site list, and that's coming soon. I have nothing this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Peter. Yeah, good evening. The only committee I, that I was on that has met during this time period was the Senior Advisory Committee, and it's actually interesting. I'll pass these out to my peers. They've actually talked about and proposed at least looking at, and we've been asked about it for a while, is their proposed senior sort of recreational area that is going to be up where the old water tower is, sort of behind the, the mobile station, between the mobile station and sort of the high school. And what's proposed is kind of a recreational area that will have a pavilion, have some pickleball courts, which people have been asking about for a while, um, some bocce courts and some horseshoes area, and then kind of a walking circle around the outside of the facility. So um, they're pretty excited about that, and I think it's been something the seniors have been asking for for a while, so pretty exciting news. So I just thought I'd share that. This will actually take form in a uh, CIP request as part of the budget, so it will receive, you know, further review and vetting. Hmm. Can I, if I could just ask a question, Peter, um, I, was there any hazmat mitigation or anything? Because my understanding was on the site of the tower there might have been some concerns about soil mitigation requirements or something like that. I, I think at this point it's sort of conceptual. They still had, they're working with Mike. There, there's some, some of those questions they still need to resolve, so okay. they're, they're kind of working on it, but this is just kind of a preliminary sort of thought about how to address some of the things they've heard about. So. Chris. Uh, so um, uh, energy didn't meet uh, since the last meeting. Um, the uh, Board of Education continues along in their superintendent search. Uh, there's a couple of different things out there. Um, the first thing is uh, some focus groups that are being scheduled for March 1st and March 2nd, one of which um, March 1st at 7 p.m. is a town and business leaders focus group. Uh, I was advised by Donna Beely, the chair, that uh, obviously everybody on the town council is invited to that. We don't need to apply or put a submission in there. They'd like us to, uh, you know, it's kind of our opportunity to go in and, and make some comments on the focus group part of it. Um, and certainly, uh, I'm not, that's at the high school all-purpose room, March 1st at 7 p.m., if, if any of you are interested. And, and again, I would, I would encourage you to, um, <coughs> to attend if possible. I know the... Um, uh, NECAP group is going to be there to discuss plans moving forward and, and I guess looking for our input in terms of criteria and things that we'd be looking for from the superintendent. Yeah, as well. I did provide a press release that yep. I'll send around just so you can schedule it and okay. get a little context as to how they want to run those, those groups. Yep. Great. Uh, and uh, independent of that though, or I shouldn't say independent, but separate of that, there's also a um, uh, parent screening group or part of a screening group that's being formed to uh, be involved in the um, screening committee of candidates. Uh, request went out to parents for uh, involvement. Uh, if anybody out there is a parent and is interested, um, they should send an email to Kelly Johnston at the school department at kjohnston at scarboroughschools.org with an email confirming your willingness and ability to attend all the required meetings as well as the specific grade level yeah, and school attended yeah. by your child or children if applicable. So uh, interested parties reach out to the school district. I'm not sure what the requirements are or if there's a quota for each number of school, but uh, certainly if there's any interest out there from parents to, to actively participate, and I would encourage that, um, reach out to the school department. So, 
And, uh, you know, again, two weeks late, uh, school board is meeting tomorrow. Um, one other thing I did want to mention, um, there is a February 25th school board meeting with our uh, legislative liaisons. And I believe the topic of discussion will be uh, the EPS funding, partly because of uh, the efforts of Councillor Rowan. So um, while that is a school board function, uh, I certainly would suggest um, councillors, if available, to, 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 to try and go. And, and certainly if, if anybody has questions or anything they'd like me to forward to the school board to be asked that are obviously educationally related, um, then I would be happy to, to, to pass those on. Um, I'm not sure the time or the location yet. Um, I can certainly get that and forward it to the to councillors as it becomes available. Chris, are, uh, are members of the public uh, besides uh, parents uh, going to be part of this uh, advisory group? I, I'm not 100% sure. The email that came out was from the superintendent. It was sent to me uh, with everybody else as a parent. Um, I just noted that, that was one of the criteria in there. Um, I'll follow up certainly tomorrow with, um, I know n um, they were laying out an entire process of how it was going to work. I think yeah. that's been finalized, obviously. Um, I, I, and the focus groups, I think, are more on getting our input on, on types of characteristics and, and attributes that we would be looking for, let's say, or would like to see in a, in a, in a successful candidate. I think this is more of a screening type to, to review applications versus criteria, that kind of stuff. Other issues, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll certainly will we'll ask the school board if there's other involvement from us and from, from public as well. And I think uh, uh, Councillor Chiesa mentioned that the school board is meeting tomorrow, so I think there will be yeah. some further clarification of the process, which I think is going to be a very open and uh, exciting process to, to search for a new superintendent. Uh, <coughs> the uh, Energy Committee, we're uh, circulating a further draft of the report. Uh, went out to uh, Energy Committee members, uh, uh, so that's uh, heading for a uh, submission to the Town Council for a workshop in the month of February. Uh, uh, we uh, recently interviewed uh, two composting companies, really the only two I think that exist in, uh, in Maine, southern Maine. Uh, we compost it uh, and garbage to garden as to what their proposals might be. They're actively expanding their business models. One of them is the organization that runs the transfer station mm -hmm. uh, here in Scarborough. The other is, I think, a gentleman who is graduated from Scarborough High School, graduated from Scarborough High School uh, with an interesting business model. So uh, composting <coughs> is one of the most difficult issues to deal with if you're trying to reduce your trash that's going uh, into landfills. And so that's why we're focusing some attention on it so that we can present, the Energy Committee can present uh, as clear a picture on what the options are and where other municipalities that are leading the way on these issues, how they're making it as palatable as possible for the community. Um, the, uh, I attended the library meeting, and I can't remember whether I reported on this or not, but I, I will note the, the thing that caught my eye was <clears throat> the uh, little free uh, public library mm -hmm. concept, this side of the road kind of uh, uh, alcove, kiosk kind of thing, and it's online. The program is uh, got a website, and people who are interested, it's very much a kind of a neighborhood resource. And uh, people who have uh, implemented them say it's an exciting addition to, to their neighborhood. So I recommend that. Uh, and more information can be obtained from Nancy Kroll, uh, who's been very active uh, in promoting this idea. So uh, town manager's report. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, not, to, not to steal any thunder from Councillor uh, Katarina, I did want to mention uh, working with her in, in a small group, we, we have prepared a simple what we call civic engagement survey. It's one of the first pieces on this communication effort and <coughs> maybe a larger uh, civic engagement strategy. And it's really intended to uh, assess and understand people's preferences, how they get their information, how they prefer to get that. 
So we, we expect that will help inform us as to which channels we need to be plugging into. Uh, we'll go live with that. It will be available through our website, and we'll use some of our other communication tools that we have in place to push people back to that site. Uh, it's not randomly selected. It's not high uh, highly scientific. Uh, but it's really one of those six or eight or nine question surveys where you know, stuffing the ballot box really doesn't make sense. We're just really interested in um, understanding what people, uh, how they like to receive their information. So, um, you didn't steal my thunder. Thank you. I okay. totally <laughs> went. I forgot well, I to write it down. It <laughs> we're going to go live tomorrow, and we'll keep it up for weeks or months or you know for for some time to get uh, a, a pretty good test of, in the community. Um, also, tax bills went out today, mailed today, so they're likely to be received by as soon as tomorrow for many oh, of us. So, <laughs> joy, joy. Uh, and in my cubby hole. As was mentioned <laughs> uh, uh, by uh, Chairman Donovan, uh, we have mapped out the next couple of months, if you will, or the next three meetings for workshops. There seems to be a willingness to meet a bit before your regular meetings. Uh, so next uh, meeting two weeks from tonight on February 17th, the Energy Committee will present their findings regarding solid waste reduction. Um, that's likely to be probably an hour session. Mm -hmm. Uh, there will be a written report as well as a presentation that evening. Uh, on March 3rd, we'll have a long-range facility plan. It's something that staff's been working on for some time. It'll be a first uh, look-see for you. First and it will be a conversation point, perhaps, that the Finance Committee gets into in a little more detail. I'm sorry, March 2nd, excuse me. And then uh, the second meeting in March, uh, Mike and crew, many of the folks that were here tonight, would like to do a stormwater management discussion with you. Um, as part of our federal permit for stormwater controls, educating the elected mm -hmm. officials on the basic standards and the public is a requirement of that. So we'll accomplish that, and I think you'll find it uh, perhaps uh, uh, educational just in terms of appreciating the, the different levels of effort we take, mm -hmm. including uh, the street sweeper that goes up and down the road that's actually a mandate of our federal stormwater permits that uh, we clean up all that roadside sand uh, mm -hmm. religiously. Um, I'll also be making my annual chamber address to the Scarborough Chamber, okay. the uh, so-called state of the town, as we call it. It, it really ends up being uh, some interesting statistics, uh, much of the information from the recent Merida uh, show, that's the real estate development group. Uh, <coughs> look backward at some of the accomplishments over the past year and also foreshadows some of the initiatives looking forward. Uh, that's going to be February 11th, 7.30 in the morning. And this year it's being held at Town & Country Federal Credit Union, their new facility here behind Hannaford. Uh, and I'll do the same presentation for the Kiwanis Club the following Friday, they've asked me to. So this is the time of year where I kind of go on the, <laughs> as I call it, the rubber chicken circuit. Uh, <laughs> but it, it's really good to get out and engage with folks that I don't have the occasion to see very often. And I'm, I'm always met with a lot of great <coughs> questions, so I look forward to this time of year. And just lastly, I just want to relate, uh, having known and worked with Jim Benedict for uh, the time as he was in the council. I'm certainly better for knowing Jim. He was, uh, he was uh, a big personality at times, uh, certainly a kind heart, and I'm, I'm certainly better for knowing him. Thank you. Uh, start down here, Chris, with <coughs> Councilor Cummins. Um, yeah, so I guess I'll start off also with uh, you know my, my comments on Councilor Benedict. Um, I didn't have the pleasure of serving with him, but I, I did get to sit across the table from him quite regularly on the school board side and, and I, uh, I do appreciate um, certainly his stoicness when it came to um, his opposition at times to the points but uh, 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 always a gentleman never seemed to, uh, to get riled or get rowdy and, and I certainly appreciated that uh, when it came to the difficult discussions. Um, I did want to piggyback on Bill's comments about the, um, the composting. I, I, I did forget that in the energy report. I apologize for that. But I did want to point out also that Garbage to Garden is actually at the schools already uh, and doing a very, um, from, from everything I've seen at the high school, certainly doing a very good job with not only the education piece of it but also the, the service aspect of it. So, so both, can, both um, potential <coughs> suppliers, if you will, are very well established and have, um, well, they have different business models. I think uh, both very good options for the town and I'm sure the Energy Commission will be making recommendations moving forward as well for that. Um, <coughs> I guess last but not least, um, we there was some preliminary budget information that came out from the from the state. Um, I do want to, having gone through this once or twice before, 
um, I would just please like to request from everybody, council, me, board, public, let's be calm, let's not get excited about this. It's the normal process. While it's not good news, it is preliminary. Um, we do need to, to work through what the real numbers are going to be, and we have to be aware of that. But, but the process as a whole needs to be um, very methodical and very um, uh, precise, if you will, and, and we've we got to be careful we don't go down that slippery slope again of getting excited about numbers and, and, and letting things get kind of out of hand and take us off the focus, and that's making sure that our priorities are straight in town and, and how do we address that. It's, it's not positive news, but it's not the end of the world, um, and it's also not... Uh, I don't think it's news that we're necessarily surprised about, maybe surprised at the amount, um, but I still think that's still generally um, preliminary. So hope for the best, but plan for the worst, and uh, we will get through this as well, but let's all remain calm. Let's, let's just work through the process, please. Thank you. Peter. Yeah, and I think I'd, I'd echo, I, I didn't work with Zabetica that much either, but I, I did observe them at times, and the voice that will be missed, and you know, thoughts and prayers with the family. And two, I'd like to kind of just build on, on Chris and actually the gentleman that talked earlier, Chris Leifer, that kind of talked about as we as we approach this budget season and as, as this community knows, we've had some challenges over the last, you know, 12 to 18 months and I really hope everybody brings sort of a different different play to the table of we're all in this together and how can we work collectively to, to get to the best place we can as a community. So I just really appeal to everybody. I think that was eloquently stated about Let's stay calm, let's listen to each other, let's have respectful conversations and look forward to the process. We'll have some tough choices. And so let's all work together. Thank you. Thank you. John. Thank you. A um, couple of things. First, uh, to Councillor Benedict, um, Godspeed and God bless. Anybody who sits behind this table deserves every person's respect in this town because it is a lot of work. It's a big commitment. And it's not just a commitment by him to the town, but it's also by his family, and uh, especially his wife, Claire, because uh, it takes a toll on a family um, over the years. And uh, really wanted to say thank you to him. I, too, did not get to serve with him, um, but uh, I do appreciate his service and his family's uh, contribution to the community. So God bless to all of them. Um, I did want to mention to the town manager's state of the town, I heard the new thing is to send a letter. So, you know, um, I, you know. <laughs> I don't think they'll pass. <laughs> you know, um, you make the choice. <laughs> um, also wanted to uh, mention, um, I might have a name, but we will remind me later. I think I have someone that might be willing to uh, serve on the Housing Alliance who has a banking background. So uh, please remind me because I've got so many things going on. I'd be happy to talk to him and then forward his name. Um, two things really regarding one public, uh, actually built around public comments and then council comments as well. Um, the first regarding um, the uh, preliminary news and people's um, receipt of that information and how it's shared and how to react to it. And so um, I'll be honest, I heard it um, last evening at a meeting and my mouth dropped. I thought I was going to um, have a baby cow right there when I heard <laughs> about it. Um, but, you know, that's kind of a normal course of work, especially after what we went through last year. So I, too, agree. Um, I hope that we really walk into this softly. But at the same time, we provide the due diligence and ask everyone, not only the council, and I know we will because it's, um, we have to make the decision, um, but the citizens remain diligent. But the bigger piece, too, is our legislative delegation remain diligent in understanding and communicating with us um, because we need to make a stand regarding how the town of Scarborough is being treated by this funding formula. And I think that that is a bigger issue um, that is outside of the decisions that we have to make regarding our budget. Um, and, and I know that we're going to do the due diligence that we need. So when we talk about drawing lines, I hope that um, when we rehearse um, asking people not to draw lines, that we're also practicing that in the mirror because it's about those who suggest we're drawing lines. They too should not be drawing lines because this is going to have to be a give and take conversation throughout the entire process because um, we all want what is best for the town as a whole. Um, last is um, about the Pine Point. Um, I really want to stress... Um, you know, this is going to be an open, uh, what I mean by Pine Point is the conversations around complete streets and the PACS projects and the vision. You know, one of the things that's very difficult in sitting in this seat is you really do have to have some 
vision going forward the next 20 years and hoping that what you're doing today really has um, a long-lasting positive impact. Um, for me, it's a challenge that I have to deal with that I, I know I can get better at, but when someone tells me that they want um, their little part of heaven to be left alone but are active in um, telling their neighbors what they can and can't have on their property doesn't really mesh up with us because um, we're all supposed to be part of the community. And what I'm referring to is when I go back to the whole issue about the land swap and the King Street property and everyone in Pine Point telling us what they wanted on that property, but yet we hear from citizens that says, well, but leave us alone and don't tell me what to do with my property. So there has to be a balance in those kind of comments as well because we need to make better decisions for the town and really look forward because I think you know, picking, not picking on King Street, but if you look at the Snowberry Park, it's a beautiful, beautiful project that really did work out well. And so um, I think that we can all be part of that and all participate in that conversation. And um, that is it. If, if I can just get the time for the delegation and the school board meeting, that would be great. But thank you. Will. So I'd, I'd also like to uh, extend my condolences to the Benedict family. Um, I also didn't know Jim terribly well, but um, he was certainly an a upstanding gentleman. Um, so my weekend was pretty well ruined by the uh, preliminary numbers uh, put out by the uh, state. Uh, I don't know how familiar everyone is with them, uh, but the, uh, if you look at where we were um, in 2009 when we really started to uh, start to lose revenue uh, over, over from that until 2016, um, our state subsidy was down about $1.9 million annually over the course of that, uh, that time period. Um, this year, with the preliminary numbers, they, we lost another $1.6 million, so almost the entire amount. Um, the, um, I, I appreciate uh, Councillor Chiazzo's comment about staying calm. And I'm trying, uh, but uh, but what happened last year was was it wasn't the formula that changed. It was there was an additional appropriation from the legislature to education, yeah. um, and that's what rescued us from losing. Uh, I don't recall the details, but but what got us from something like 900,000 down to only losing 150,000. Um, so at this point, my understanding is that the formula is the formula. For this year, that's that's state law, and any changes that we want to talk about in terms of how the uh, the inherent unfairness that we can talk about in in relation to how <coughs> Scarborough has been treated is really a conversation for future years. Uh, really, all we can do this year is lobby our legislature for an additional appropriation, um, and and certainly I've, I've started that process, although uh, I, I'm trying to again stay calm. Uh, the, uh, uh, but I hope that we can all continue and, and, and really drive home the, the, the point, which is that, you know, the, the property taxpayers of Scarborough are paying for the education of, of the children of Scarborough, and the income taxpayers of Scarborough are paying for the education of the children of Cumberland and Falmouth, and that strikes me the wrong way. Um, so I'm going to set that aside and talk about some other things. Um, Kindness Week is coming up next week. Mm -hmm. um, I, I hope that uh, people will um, uh, go to the Scarborough Kindness Project for ideas for the Random Act of Kindness Week. Um, I'm sorry, it's the week after it starts. Uh, Valentine's, Valentine's Day. Day. It starts Valentine's <laughs> Day. This coming week, we have uh, the fuel rally for Project Grace is on Saturday. Um, it's Saturday morning at the fire station. I don't know. Do you know the exact time? Yes, ten to uh, ten to noon is the fuel assistance. Um, and then something else to report is that the library is going to be collecting winter clothing. So um, uh, certainly if you have spare jackets and, and snow pants and such, please, please take them there and mittens and hats. Um, and then there's uh, uh, a point about February break is coming up. Um, it's coming up quickly. Um, the backpack program is looking for donations. Um, uh, and essentially what this is is, is some of the children in town are given backpacks full of foods that go home with them over vacation so that, you know, the, the, just to, to, to combat hunger, um, childhood hunger. Uh, they're specifically looking for uh, instant potatoes, rice, pasta, vegetables, canned meats, pancake mix, syrup, crackers, chili and stew, muffin mix, 
uh, hamburger helper and uh, snack food. Um, and you can you can drop food off by uh, at any of the the school offices, and it's due by <coughs> February eighth. And they'll take money to right? donations, monetary donations. I I think they are, but I don't I don't know that. I I can't speak <coughs> to that. I, I, well, well I'm, well, I'm sorry. There's also a list of what they don't need. Maybe it, I think that was at the bottom of it too. Did you see that part as well? I didn't. I didn't copy. They don't need peanut butter. <laughs> yeah, there, there's, a, there's a couple <laughs> things that they that they. So I think is, there might be. A, I don't know if there's a website or something we can go to. to uh, you, you know, it's it's been a couple. Uh, I've just seen Jessica Libby and Kelly Murphy's posts on Facebook, and that's okay. what I base my stuff off. But if there is a website, I'd love to know. I'll try and get it tomorrow. Okay. Awesome. You, Marie. Yes. Um. Is. Uh, Mr. Hall mentioned uh, we are going to have the civic engagement um, survey on the town website starting tomorrow. So I really encourage folks to answer a few questions for us. We're really interested in basically knowing how people want to be communicated with and how you get your news. I'm looking at the newspaper. Folks out here. <laughs> um, but the various ways so that we'll know as a town how best to communicate with you. We are working on a town Facebook page, which should be coming sooner rather than later. Um, <clears throat> see my uh, Pine Point, the concerns about Pine Point. We had very successful reaction down at Higgins Beach to the zone changes and whatever, and that's because we had civic engagement through this process called charrettes, um, which is kind of a fancy word for meetings and, and focus groups and whatever. There is a plan, I know, with the planning department, because I'm on Long Range Planning Committee, to do that same process in Pine Point. So those people were concerned about, oh, are we going to have any say in what's going on down there? Yes, you're going to have say. There's going to be a lot of input. Um, and please stay tuned and please keep an open mind. Uh, to, to what can happen and what your neighbors uh, may be interested in doing or not doing down there. Um, <clears throat> Operation Hope, the last number I saw, and I haven't been on top of it because I've been fairly busy the last few days, was 110 people assisted uh, to reach treatment, which I think is amazing given we started in October. I met with uh, Senator Chris Johnson um, from Knox County, I believe he represents. I can always get my counties confused when you get down east. They are st no Lincoln County. Sorry, Lincoln County. Lincoln County Sheriff's Department is starting an Operation Hope, and uh, Officer Gill and uh, Chief Moulton have been helpful with with that with them, and he was very thankful for that. Um, <clears throat> again, fuel assistance. 10 to noon at the fire station, right over across the street. Please come up. There's going to be baked goods. There's going to be fun things for the kids to do. The kids can sit on the fire trucks and the ambulances. Uh, if you don't, if you're busy running around and getting groceries, they, we have a drive-through. You can just drive through one of the bays and give us some money and drive on off. So, uh, but it's very important, even though it's Thankfully, it's been a very warm winter so far, and heating prices are low. There are still many people in this community who struggle um, with, with paying for fuel, so anything you can donate will be uh, very helpful. I know I'm going to be there for the whole time. Usually my job is to go out and wave a sign on the sidewalk. That's what I've been known to do. I know some other counselors are planning to stop by and say hi, so come on in. Um, <coughs> see here. I am trying to stay calm too <laughs> about the school funding uh, potential uh, loss of revenue from school funding formula. I personally have never particularly cared for the way the formula is done. To me, uh, an interesting thing that the legislature <coughs> should be looking at is, okay, so you've got a town that's very wealthy, like we are, we're the third wealthiest town in the state valuation, and we have, you know, a school population that's supposedly not as high as some others, and then they do whatever they do, and Will's, Will's the expert in this, this. But we also have <coughs> one of the largest, if not the largest, number of people on fixed incomes, retired people in this town. So that's kind of like they don't take that into consideration, and maybe they should. But 
So I would just say keep calm and contact your legislative delegation because as much as we can complain about it and whatever, it's really helpful if people from town also say, hey, how can you help us out here? And then last but absolutely not least, uh, Jim Benedict. I did have the pleasure of serving with Jim. <coughs> Jim and I did not always agree on things and fiscal and what we should be spending money on in town, but I loved him to pieces. I really did, and I was very sad to um, hear of his passing, and he will be missed. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, each meeting, I'd like to be able to provide at least some comment or update on uh, uh, the goals that we set so that we kind of keep an eye on those. Uh, the communications goal is one that we're active on. Uh, I know that the uh, Rules Committee will be meeting probably within the next week or so uh, to um, start to uh, analyze and develop rules for social media programs. Uh, uh, Jean Marie and the town manager have been working with our IT department on the development of a Facebook page, uh, which was one of the important initiatives, uh, improving the electronic newsletter and other means, the uh, survey that was mentioned previously. Uh, so there's been an active effort to uh, advance how we effectively communicate and hear uh, what's going on with uh, the constituents of our community. Um, I'd like to uh, end with a God bless you to uh, Jim Benedict. I did serve with him for a couple of years and uh, uh, he was very kind uh, to me, very welcoming. Uh, he had his own viewpoint on things, but that did not deter him from being friendly and a uh, very pleasant yeah. person to deal with. So with that, I'll ask for an adjournment motion. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor?